pre-recorded. This is the Red Ticket Blues Podcast. I am Brian Buckley. This is hitting the internet on January 7th, 2016. Uh, on Tuesday, I was lucky enough to speak with Mr. Richard Sandemir, a sports and TV columnist for the New York Times. We went over a myriad of topics, lots of things to discuss. We we got into a little college football, the, the you know uh, sports entertainment regional networks, the Yes Network in, in particular, uh, the local football teams. He discussed the beauty of of being bald like himself and uh for you yankee fans pride of the yankee fans well there's there's even a little talk of uncle otto if you know what i'm talking about enough of the teases let's get to the interview we welcome in sports and television columnist for the new york times richard sandemir richard thanks for being on the red ticket blues podcast today my pleasure brian what does red red ticket blues refer to i'm so glad someone finally asked that i really (laughs) am i think i may have mentioned it on a podcast a solo podcast of mine but i'm glad a guest mentioned that's great so you're familiar with the movie major league correct yes i am so in spring training when uh tom berenger is telling the rest of the rookies when you see a red ticket in mm-hmm. your locker, a red tag in your locker, that means you just died and got sent to the minors. So <laughs> okay. basically, I changed tag to ticket just for search uh-huh. engine optimization, hopefully, that will bring your <laughs> hits there. And the blues, meaning, well, that sucks that you're being sent to the okay. minors. So there you go. Okay. All right. Uh, last week, you wrote about ESPN's desire to stamp its presence on New Year's Eve with college mm-hmm. football semifinal bowl games. So my question is, was ESPN successful in reinventing your New Year's Eve? No, I still went out to dinner, although I was back in time for the second half of the, of, of the second semifinal. Uh, you know, it's not entirely their their fault that it didn't work out. They did ask the college football playoff board to, to make a change to Saturday night, January 2nd, and they were rebuffed. Uh, the board of managers of the college football playoff simply wanted to have everything together on those two days, and they said no. So the, the the viewership was way down, far more than anybody could have expected. Of course, everybody expected that there'd be some drop off. People are working and partying on New Year's Eve. So no, it it didn't transform my my New Year's Eve because it's my wife's birthday also. So oh, okay. I, I I wasn't going to be there for much of it anyway. <laughs> uh, I mean, staying in the topic of ESPN, Fox Sports has attempted to compete with ESPN by way of you know league contracts and co-ownership of regional networks. Can they or any other sports broadcasting entity have a real shot going toe-to-toe with ESPN in the near future? No, I, I actually think that you, any competitor is going to have a very, very long uh, run-up to being competitive with them throughout the day. You could have certain things where certain events that ESPN doesn't have and be able to nip at their heels a little bit, but Look, they started in 1979, and they have the rights to so many things. Uh, Fox has been aggressive, but there's only a certain amount of things they can have. They have certain uh, college football contracts. They don't have the SEC. Uh, that's a difficult thing not to have. Right. Uh, they have. They don't have the NFL on Fox Sports 1. That's difficult not to have. Uh, they have baseball, but... Yeah, so does you know, so does ESPN. They have ESPN has a tradition of their studio shows. Not not all of them are great, but you know, Sports Center is ensconced, and I find it very very hard to watch Fox's equivalent. Uh, Agreed. You try to be, you try to be different, uh, but then you realize what your comfort level is, and only then maybe a small minority of people are going to watch what's some what's very radically off what you're used to at eleven o'clock. So it's it's um, you know they may aggressively and if they get the Big Ten contract on their own uh, that's going to be very helpful. Uh, but they already own a chunk of the Big Ten network, so Fox could you know could compete that way. But they have a long long way to go. Uh, you know, getting someone like Colin Coward may help a little bit, but it's not it's not the equivalent of 30 years experience uh, or a 35 year head start that that ESPN has. Very difficult to do. Yeah, you mentioned Sports Center, and I really personally don't like the direction that Sports Center has gone. And you look at Fox Sports as equivalent, which is yeah. almost just a JV version of yeah, something that's yeah. been watered down in the first place. Um, well, and also the two guys from Canada whose names yeah, I, that's, know, I some, some, here. They, they they fly out of my head. <laughs> it's it's just. It's, it feels like tomfoolery. Yeah, it's almost and, like they're doing stand-up almost. Isn't yeah, it? It, it, it is. And again, if that is the intent to differentiate, they're going to have to live with that. Uh, it's that, 
you know, we're so used to Sports Center, and they have changed over the years. And you know, sometimes you're going to like the direction, sometimes you're not. And you know, if you look at the Van Pelt show, that's a different version of what they're trying to do, making it kind of a talk show at, at midnight. Um, what I've seen of that, I like. I, I like okay, but you know, certainly, uh, you know, 36 years of Sports Center, you know, you get a little jaded about it. But then when you see somebody else try to do the same thing, you say, well. God, that's weird or that's mm. different. I'm not sure I can get used to that. Uh, uh, you know, SportsCenter has such a huge cadre of, of of anchors, some of whom are just kind of robotic and not very good, but some of them are, are very good. Um, but And I know Fox has other anchors besides the two guys from Canada. I just can't get those two guys out of my head. <laughs> uh, let's let's jump into a little bit about you. Uh, before, okay. before you joined the Times, you covered a lot of business news. Uh, did you always have sports in the back of your mind as a goal, or did you want to just tackle the next challenge ahead of you? No, no, no. I I had no idea I'd ever get into sports. Uh, so let me track back. Um, I graduated Queens College in 79. I started working uh, full-time temporarily for Newsday, filling in for somebody who had a bad illness. And I was covering local news in Queens and um, and then I went to work for the newspaper in Stanford, Connecticut, covering business. Uh, uh, well, before that, I worked for a business magazine. And I, and, and I figured in the early 80s, business was a right way to go. Mm-hmm. It was getting hot as a, uh, as a subject of coverage. Uh, and uh, so I, Financial World magazine was my start in business. Then I went to the Stanford, Connecticut paper. Then I went back to Newsday. And for four of the five years there, I covered – uh, me, uh, mostly media-related business, so I got a taste of that kind of stuff. But Newsday, although it was the eighth or ninth largest paper in the country, people around the country didn't know it. So if you're doing a media story, you'd sort of be happy if they mistook Newsday for Newsweek. Right. And when you were saying, please call back, and even on the big mergers, and I was there for you know covering some of the big media mergers of the middle 80s, um, Newsday was not on the axis of uh, you know the Times, the LA Times, the Washington Post, where you'd get the head of Time, uh, Time Inc. to talk to you, or the head of RCA to talk to you. They just, they just didn't. And um, uh, I got disgruntled with working at Newsday after five years. I went to work for Bantam Books. I was covering book publishing, and I'll, I'll, I, I've always referred to this now. It's been a long time as uh, the worst job I ever had, but the best move I ever made. Um, I was a publicist, and I was working for a guy I covered. Uh, his name, he, he shall go nameless. He was the, you know, very, very difficult boss to work for. Um, what, what seemed eccentric in covering him became difficulty in working for him. And I found it very hard to maximize the work of other people rather than do my own work. So, you know, some people like writing press releases and doing book tours. And some of it was fulfilling, but when you see a book sell well because of the efforts you made, but it was really, really difficult. And from my second week on, I was trying to leave. And after about four months, uh, Newsday's parent company at the time, Times Mirror, was, you know, announced it was starting a sports business magazine called Sports Inc. And if you're familiar with Sports Business Journal, Sports Inc. is what Sports Business Journal should have been. But we, we, we had some very bad people on the business side who didn't know what they were doing. Hired a lot of good reporters, uh, they didn't know how to run it uh, on the business end. So it lasted for a year and a half, but that's where I got my abilities. I, I, I was able to use my business knowledge, such as it was. I, I knew how to read a 10K report, and that's probably far more than anybody else on the staff knew. So I was covering baseball, and I was covering sports economics. And from there, I, I, I started – we went out of business after a year and a half – then I started freelancing for a bunch of places like the LA Times. Then I started. Then I was hired by the New York Times. Strangely enough, to write a TV column um, because I wasn't really covering the TV side of things, uh, but they needed somebody, and that's where I ended up twenty, almost twenty-five years ago. We'll talk a little TV in a little bit. Um, you know, in addition to 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 all the the accomplishments you just listed here, you also written and co-written several books, uh, including Bald Like Me and the Final Four. Yes. And the final four of everything. Right, right. Uh, well, the yeah, I, when I was in that period between uh, that freelance period after Sports Inc went out of business, I um, I signed a contract to write a book, a memoir about being bald. I was just starting to noticeably get bald. Well, not just starting, but it was I still had a, a decent amount of hair, but it was receding a lot. 
and I, you know, made a deal with Collier Books to write a, to, to write a book that was uh, kind of episodic. It had Q and A's with well-known bald people. It had a, you know, had a history of baldness. It had, you know, um, the story of meeting my wife while uh, wearing a toupee at Disney World. Uh, my future wife. She she didn't know she was going to be a wife when she met me. Um, and um, so that that sold pretty well. You know, I did a lot of publicity for it. it you know, gave me a taste for for being on TV. And after that, I wrote a you know a couple of humor books with my uh, with the editor the editor of Bold Like Me, Rick Wolf, uh, and I wrote two or three humor books. Um, uh, we did there were parodies, the parodies of the Dummies books, parodies of the Don't Sweat the Small Stuff books. And then uh, my agent and I at the time um, collaborated on two. Uh, books about the bra- about bracketology, uh, the enlightened bracketologist, and then the final four of everything. And we basically hired well-known experts in various fields, and culture, and sports, and food, and various other and politics, and asked them to create a bracket of their own, you know, create a bracket on their field of expertise. Um, we hired White House speechwriters to do, you know, great speeches uh, bracket and to run the, you know run their bracket down to who wins and do a little commentary on on in, in the margins and um and I am currently working on a uh, book about the making and legacy of the movie Pride of the Yankees. Oh nice a little uh, a little inside look at Uncle Otto maybe maybe <laughs> Yes there will be Uncle Otto there <laughs> and uh uh, in, it, it, uh, recently, I spent uh, five days inside the Samuel Goldwyn archive at the oh, Motion Picture nice. Library in Beverly Hills, and very few people have been inside it because you, you have to have a book contract or some legitimate reason to get in there. And it was just an, an unbelievable experience to see all the scripts uh, from start to finish, to see publicity plans, to see uh, uh, letters and telegrams. Uh, you know, Samuel Goldwyn was. You know, one of the great independent producers of that era, and uh, Con- Babe Ruth's contract, Teresa Wright's contract, um, and really, it 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 tracks exactly from the start of when um, Goldwyn contacted Eleanor Gehrig through you know the release of the film, which at the time was the highest-grossing film Samuel Goldwyn had ever produced. And um, I'm from I've gotten friendly with Gary Cooper's daughter. Uh, and I just spoke to the grandson of Goldman's number two guy, uh, a guy named James Mulvey, who actually tracked down Eleanor Gehrig to sign to sign her to a, 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 the, the contract. And um, so that's that's been this book has been in my mind for quite a while, and I'm I'm glad to be able to finally write it, and it'll be out in time for the 75th anniversary of the movie in 2017. You know, Pride of the Yankees. Uh, I mean, it is. I think you've even described it. It's it's, it's a hokey movie, but it is an all-time classic. I remember my father, uh, Ken Buckley, friend of the podcast, mm-hmm. sat me down <laughs> on a rainy day and said, "You're going to watch this," because I was complaining that I was bored, and I watched it, and I, and then I watched it again. I mean. It's it's a different time in cinema. Sure. I think you have to realize that. I mean, the the dramatic paw, the dramatic question of Garrick asking the doctor mm-hmm. is it, is it three strikes yeah. doc? I mean, that right. would never fly in a movie today for action. No, no, it wouldn't. No, no, with his lack of athleticism, he wouldn't. <laughs> he, he, you know, Gary Cooper would not play Lou Gehrig now. You'd have to get somebody. You know, we we we've seen how Kevin Costner is a far better baseball player than Gary Cooper was. Right. But, you know, back then, it, it didn't matter. It was one of the first biopics based on a true story. Yeah. Uh, you know, Cooper had one more picture to make for Goldwyn to end his contract. Uh, you know, if you see the list of other people who were, quote, considered, and I don't think any of them were really considered, you know, there were a mix of ball players and actors. Can you imagine Eddie Albert as Lou Gehrig? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, he, he was on a list. Uh, so you, you, you almost can't imagine anybody else but that because the memory of Gehrig's speech is really much more notable through Cooper's version of it than through newsreels, which are incredibly incomplete and we only see bits and pieces of them. So, you know, part of the legacy is how the Gehrig image has been perpetuated through Cooper's portrayal. Uh, and, and, and the rest of the movie, you know, uh, yes, it, it is hokey, um, it is of its time, and you know, I, I accept it. But I, you know, and it, it's 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 there's a lot of fiction in it. Um, but to me, what's fun about writing the book is seeing how the fiction was created and seeing, 
you know, what could have been in the movie, which was taken right. out either in the script writing revisions or on the cutting room floor. It's, it's, it's really quite amazing. And it's, it, it's sort of a wartime movie because it came out early in our involvement in the war. And it was the first movie. Uh, it was the last Hollywood premiere uh, with all the big lights and, and the big coup de doo in Hollywood before wartime restrictions on lighting went into effect. Really? Hmm. So yeah, it's it's you know it's it, it, it's of it's of its time, including the wartime. And uh, imagine if Lou had just been an engineer. I mean, in, instead of instead of a baseball it, player. It, the, the, the Uncle Otto story. <laughs> uh, just quickly getting back to, I want to combine yeah. both of those books and a question that yeah I mentioned, uh, Bald Like Me and uh, the Final Four of Everything. You you're right. responsible for four brackets, including top bald people throughout history. <laughs> your Mount Rushmore of baldness: Homer Simpson, Winston right. Churchill. George Foreman and Gandhi. What was the criteria yeah. for picking the top bald man f- from the <laughs> Fab Four here? Well, you've 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 done your work there. I mean, Damn I mean, straight. I, I, at, at another time, I probably would have had John Glenn and Michael Jordan as the, uh, you know, it, the criteria. Well, look at them. They're four great achievers in very in various different ways. How can you, you know, you 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 can you can argue four different ones, and that's part of why Mark and I wrote the book, because. You know, bracketology is all about arguing, and if you can create the bracket on your own rather than wait for teams to play and, and beat each other, uh, that's what made it fun. But h- how can you how can you beat Gandhi? How can you beat Churchill? Uh, you know, is Homer Simpson, you know, the greatest, certainly the greatest, you know, animated baldy of all time. True. Uh, so, but you know, certainly John Glenn deserves. You know, on a, on a different day in a different mood, <laughs> could have been John Glenn. For you know, first Baldy to you know uh, to go up in space, you know, yeah, pretty impressive. So yeah, I mean, it, it's just a you know, it it was informed whim, put it that way. Okay, last bald question, I promise. Yeah, um, sure. baldness is something you're quite passionate about. I mean, you're passionate yep. enough to write a book about it. Yeah, you you take pride in your hairstyle when other men find themselves you know at the at the mercy of Monoxidil and Giuseppe Franco commercials. Right. Uh, right. What separates you from the rest of the people with your, with this? I don't I don't want to use the word condition, but uh, this this uh, <laughs> hairstyle. Um, I guess part of it is that uh, you know I wasn't terribly successful socially with a full head of hair. Um, that. I found a wife who accepted me, you know, as a you know, as, as a boyfriend. After after I took off the toupee she met me with, um, uh, you know, after Disney World, a week later we went on a date and I made a whole production of telling her it was fake and she knew it was fake because uh, it looked fake. Um, but she accepted it very quickly. And you know, when I was doing the book tour, um, uh, I was I was struck by whenever on a, certainly on the radio shows how women would mo- were the bulk of the callers and they would say, I don't understand why my husband or boyfriend is doing a comb over or bad toupee. I don't get it. And, um, you know, any kind of replacement to me seemed odious because I always feel like pe- somebody's going to know. Right. You know, if you, if everybody knows you with a big receding hairline, and the next day you come in with a, a, a rug or you come in with a bandaged head because you've, you've had a hair replacement and, you know, somebody, some doctor has, you know, plucked plugs from the back of your head and re-implanted them like, you know, corn crop in the front of your head. <laughs> uh, and, you know, it's, it, it's going to be noticeable. And, you know, do I ha- have I had days where I said, well, I wish I had more hair. I, you know, I got a big head, you know, uh, it would be nice to have something on it. But I also got to wear hats, you know, and, and you know, I used to wear like a beret in, in, in cold weather, which didn't do anything to reduce the cold. Now I can wear, a, you know, a ski cap and I'm not worried about, you know, hat hair. So there were, you know, and writing the book was great therapy. Um, I, I, I was self-conscious very early on. I was noticeable, it was noticeable when I was in my early 20s, maybe, you know, the latter stages of, of college. So my social life wasn't very good at that point. So I guess that's what separates me. And flashing forward, you know, um, I shaved it all off about 10 or 11 years ago with the um, encouragement of Charles Barkley. Oh, really? I was, yeah, I was uh, sitting in a uh, soundstage in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, um, where TNT was filming some playoff promos. 
And uh, I've known Charles for a long time. And I said, you know, you know, and I, this is shading it all off because what I had in the sides was like Ed Koch like. So it was very thin. And I sent a lot of money to style what little there was there. And I said, hey, Chuckles, um, how do you shave your head? And he said, well, brother, um, I, I used to use a razor, you know, an electric razor, but it didn't get down to the stubble. So I, I use, you know, shaving cream and a, and a regular razor. He said, and then he put his hand on my forearm. Uh, and, and he said, why, brother, are you thinking of coming home? Because what you got ain't working for you. <laughs> so on a day off, soon, soon, day off soon after I went to a barber, I did it. I felt a whole lot better about it. Um, you know, I was spending upwards of a hundred dollars to style what little I had. So, but only quarterly because it didn't, didn't grow very, you know, uh, it didn't grow very long. So, I uh, saved four hundred dollars a year plus, you know, hair care products. And in the ten or twelve years since, uh, I've rarely, I've not regretted shaving it off. Uh, what I, you know, do I see men with, you know, heads of hair at my age that I would like to have? Sure, and you know, Tony Kornheiser. You know, once famous, famously said that, you know, George Steinbrenner's hair is too afraid to move. Um, you know, he had that head of, head of hair till he died. It's just pretty impressive. Yes. So, you know, um, but, you know, you, you live with what you have. And, um, you know, my wife has, my wife's first husband wore a bad toupee, and, um, which she had to pay for. So, you know, she was very happy when I took mine off and revealed my true self. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Uh, quickly moving on. That was great, actually. Um, uh, we'll get it just quickly uh, because it's been happening in the last two days here. The NFL season is over in New mm-hmm. York for all intents and purposes. Uh, Todd Bowles, first Jets head coach to not make the playoffs in his first year in quite a while. Maybe that's a good thing. Uh, with lots of guys hitting free agency, uh, Mike McCadden has a, the numbers to balance on the payroll there. With all that being said and taken into consideration, Ryan Fitzpatrick, is he the mm-hmm. QB for the Jets next year? Oh, I think so. I, I, you know, unless they find somebody better than that. But he set some records for a jet quarterback. He's look. He's not. He's not. Doesn't have a future ahead of him like a uh, like Luck or 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 anybody or some of the younger great quarterbacks. But I'll take him. You know, if the alternative is a is an untried rookie or Geno Smith. I will take Ryan Fitzpatrick any day. Did he have a bad day the other day? Sure he did. Yes. Um, was it a bad time to have a bad day? Sure it was. Um, does he have a short half-life as quarterback? Probably. Uh, you, you know, certainly the Jets are going to be looking for a future quarterback. He's not He's not the guy you want for the next 10 years. Uh, but he's, you know, based on what he did for the first 15 games, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take him for next season. And, as you know, uh, I, I I can't not be a Jet fan because that's what I grew up as. You try as a reporter not to show your your favoritism, but you know when I watch a game just as a person, I and the Jets do well, and you know I I I will you know punch the you know the air uh, with with some joy that usually is diminished by something that happens later. But this was a good season. Ten and six is is a good season, and it's ten and six usually gets into the playoffs and. So it didn't, um, and I'm I I, I can't, as a fan I can't be unhappy. As a writer, I it's kind of, it was kind of fun to watch you know serial dysfunction for forty some odd years, but uh, so I have to balance those two in my in, in, on top of my bald head. <laughs> so. Todd Bowles was just on with Mike Francesa actually just now, and he he didn't mm-hmm. sound very happy, but I could still imagine the sting is has still. He yet, there. Has, has he yet sounded happy? That's that uh, that is exactly the case. It, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it, it, you don't judge that. I mean, we we've seen you know uh, a very emotional coach retire from the or or, or 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 step down from the Giants. I remember when Coughlin was before he sort of transformed his personality. I did a column that calculated how many times he showed the, the red Coughlin face during games. Um, you know, it was fascinating to watch this guy explode constantly on the sidelines, and, and certainly he had you no know, health repercussions from that, but some people would have a heart attack from what he did. Um, and, you know, we've seen the emotion of Rex Ryan, and it, you know, uh, it didn't work after the first two seasons for the Jets. 
So I like bowls that they're no, the, the highs aren't high and the lows aren't low. So maybe if they win the Super Bowl, we'll see we'll see a, a smile for more than five seconds. Well, that'd be uh, nice. But I, I have no I have no problem with his personality as long as the team plays well and doesn't make mistakes like it did in the, the, the final game. Uh, real quick on Coughlin, we're recording this on a Tuesday, and uh, Tom Coughlin just a few hours ago officially, you know, stepped down at the press conference with the New York Giants. Now it was long rumor, and I mean, it wasn't any secret that this was mostly, most likely, Tom's last mm-hmm. year. Sure. Now, my question: Do you think his non-discipline of Odell Beckham after that fracas against the Panthers had anything to do do with it, or do you think it was already written in stone as his demise? Well, you know. The Marin and Tisch families are very deliberate about those things, and I think they understood that his lack of discipline of Beckham was a way not to feed him to the wolves. Um, I think John Marin's a very smart guy and a shrewd guy, and no, I don't think he would, uh, you know, force him force Coughlin out because he didn't discipline Beckham. I, I wrote that I thought that you know optically it didn't look good that no. he over there and put his arm around him and, and, and say something to him. You know, old Coughlin would have. You know, oh, yeah. 2003 Coughlin definitely would have. He would have been out on the field screaming at him and maybe slapping him on the, on the helmet. Uh, but this is part of his new personality. And I think, you know, uh, Beckham has he, – he got the he got the suspension uh, for one game, but he also got a lot of bad things said about him. And he didn't. And I, I think Coughlin quickly calculated he didn't need more. Uh, and you know that's the compassionate Coughlin. Maybe he, re, you know, he he regards certain players as his kids. And you know, if he's gotten more compassionate over the last decade because he has all these grandchildren, you know, um, I think it, it'll bode. It'll certainly bode well for him. You know, as people look back on his. Giants tenure, and and maybe if he has another tenure with another team, uh, yeah, he he you know, did, he didn't rule out coaching, yeah, uh, no, and he'll be viewed as you know something nobody would have thought of a decade ago as its players coach. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just let's transition here to baseball, sure. particularly with pitchers and catchers reporting in 43 days. What's been making news in baseball circles is the fact that John Smoltz will be taking over for Tom Verducci and Harold Reynolds. Uh, you wrote that the ousted duo were seen as overly talkative and mm-hmm. lacking strong chemistry, which I agree with. But were you surprised that Fox made the move based on the recent World Series rating spike, or was this, say, a long time coming? You know, they've been pretty opaque about this. And, um, you, know, you know, John Entz, their head of production, uh, basically said Smoltz's availability and his progress over the last two years made him sort of an inevitable choice. He does work for them. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think too many uh, assignments are uh, changed because of ratings. You know, I don't think announcers affect ratings. Uh, I, I, maybe they affect, you know, blowouts. You want to keep hearing what Vince Scully has to say or what – you know, Marv Albert has to say, but I, I don't think that happens very much. I think they made a good choice. I think they made a questionable choice in the first place when they hired uh, Reynolds and Verducci for a role that neither of them were ready for. And Tom's wonderful writing didn't translate to wonderful talking. And, you know, there wasn't a rest from either one of them. Um, I wrote in the postseason last year that that Harold was making mistakes and that he didn't even have a great grasp on on one or two elements of his own career. Um, I like Harold as a studio guy. I thought that he deserved at some point to be promoted to, you know, a baseball booth. I was wrong. Uh, His knowledge is, he has good baseball knowledge, but I don't think it translates to the time he has to say it during a game. Uh, that's three hours versus, you know, a couple of, you know, 30 seconds or 45 seconds, you know, at a time in a, in a studio setting where you have maybe four or five other announcers there. Um, given time, they might have been better, but Harold's voice isn't very good. Uh, it sounds like he always has a, a bad cold. And, you know, some of it is just how you sound. I mean, you want, you, you want to have a welcoming voice or one that's compelling enough that you have to listen to. Neither one of them were. Tom is going to continue to call, you know, games, you know, other games for for Fox, but I just, you know, you know they're both very, very chatty, and right. you know that's where three in the booth falls apart. 
you know, somebody has to know their role. And that is, you know, you, you, you kind of, you know, mix and match. Some guy, some, sometimes one guy's going to say more, the other guy just says a little bit. And um, I don't think either of them could, could, could really control how chatty they were. And, you know, Tom has a lot of stories and a lot of stats and, you know, baseball announces and, uh, you know, have to be careful of how, you know, how far they go into sabermetrics. Um, some of it's a little hard to explain. Some of it takes a little more time. You don't have that much time. Uh, right. You know, I would rather, you know, this is a, kind of an old, old style thing to say. I'd rather hear Vince Scully call a game alone and have a minimal amount of statistics and a maximum number of stories and occasionally a reference to a musical comedy uh, <laughs> than, than, than anybody else. I'd rather, I'd rather hear Gary Cohn and, and um, Darling and Hernandez call a game because the two of them offer something different. Uh, they're not over talking each other. They have roles. You know, Keith is kind of the, you know, the guy who's going to go off the deep end once in a while and, <laughs> you know, be a little wacky. And Ron is, is very kind of very straight arrow, but because they've been known each other for so long, they mix and match very well. And Gary is a great orchestrator. Yeah. To me, that's the best team working. And, uh, but, you know, Smoltz is a very, very good hire. He, too, was, when he first started, really overly chatty, and he's cut that down. Now I think he can do, uh, you know, he, he, he can bring a traditional kind of analyst's voice to the game. He's got, he's a really, really smart guy, and he's, he has more than just pitching analysis to offer. I think he's, I think it's a, it's a great choice. Yeah, I found Reynolds to, like you said, make mistakes and then not really own up to them, come up with some yeah. sort of haphazard excuse for them. Mm -hmm. And Verducci seemed to be very uh, impressed and excited by very minor things. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're, you're absolutely right about that. And, and the mixture is not good. And, you know, Buck's a professional. He's not going to, you know, slap one aside and say, that's, you know, Tom, that's inconsequential. You know, what are you talking about? Right. Uh, you got to be polite in there. You don't want to embarrass your partners. And I'm sure he liked working with them because, you know, Tom and, and Harold are nice people. Uh, and Tom is really, really good at what he does for Sports Illustrated. He's terrific. He is. And he's a good, and he's he's a very good reporter, a TV reporter, but you know it's it's different. That you know, remember when Brian Gumble did uh, NFL games, yeah, uh, for the NFL Network. Look, here's a guy who knows how to do a studio as well as anybody else. Out of his element. But, but out of his element, uh, you know, it turns out he had a kind of a thin, a thin high voice that didn't translate to a football booth no. where you have to talk over the crowd in the studio. You you don't have to talk, you have to talk over the the stage manager. Um, so, you know, some people are, are, are just not suited for changing their own paradigm, you know, and you, you can't, you can't argue what they're trying. Nothing or, wrong with or, that. Yeah. Or somebody saying, we'd like to hire you, Harold and Tom, to be our number one announcers, even though you've never done anything like this before. Right. Um, yeah, both had called some games, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't like you know, five years, you know, with the Phillies and Mets before, you know, Tim McCarver got, you know, uh, something like that. He, he got his first big gig uh, with, with the National Network, and maybe a few, few, you know, a couple few years. But you know, I think unless you're extraordinary, you should start with local. No, no shame in that. Uh, most people come from local. Right. Um, but you know, to leap into a number one thing, and I know there's a lot of people. There are a lot of people who don't like McCarver, but he was really good for a long time, and he changed the way things are done. Uh, I understand some of the criticism of him, but I think you know, as a whole, you know, most games he taught me something, and most games he was ahead of, you know, he was telling you what was going to happen before it was going to happen. Nobody uh, called it perfectly, and other than that, what, 2001 World Series with Luis right. Gonzalez's base head, he said, exactly. you know, be playing in. I mean, that was just perfect. It couldn't be any yeah. better than that. Uh, no, and, and, but he did that sort of thing on a regular basis. And, you know, some of the things he said didn't come true, right. but, you know, he put himself out there. And that's what I love about announcers who, who will say, I think this is going to happen. Uh, and sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it doesn't. But, you know, if it's based on your knowledge of the game and how you played it and how you observed it, uh, throw it out there. You can be wrong. So, right. so knowledge of the game, we, we're talking booths, we're talking studio. Is Fox or anyone else, are they, they keeping a seat warm for the darling of last year's World Series, that Mr. Alexander Emmanuel Rodriguez? I think, uh, I, I, you know, I think Fox, you know, has two open seats to, to, to baseball's transgressors. 
uh, Alex and uh, and Pete. Uh, That's if and, Pete's not busy doing something. If he's not going to a card signing show or something like that. Well, yeah, because he, you know, he basically lives in that that that, that card and memorabilia shop in, mm-hmm. Las, in Las Vegas Mall. But you know, guys like guys got to make a living, right? Um, yeah, I, th- I think Fox has has a seat open for him, and I thought he did very very well. Um, surprisingly well, and you know, when you hear all the stories about how knowledgeable he is about baseball and how other players like to talk to him about it, yeah, there it was. Yeah, I mean, I, I usually when people say that, I, I think, okay, that's just announcers filling time, yeah, trying to build exactly. a guy. But he obviously did know what he was talking about. He obviously did, and he didn't play into Pete's the way the way Pete teased Frank Thomas, and you know, who is one of the worst announcers I've ever seen. Um, and, you know, uh, Pete seemed to have this teasing relationship with him that Frank liked. Uh, but, you know, he tried to raz A-Rod, and A-Rod didn't take it. A-Rod was usually not standing next to him, so that's probably helpful. But uh, I, th- I think he did very well. And, you know, it's, it's another part of Alex that is – it's a part of Alex that's likable. Uh, some of the things he's done are not, not likable. But I don't know if he wants to do this for his full-time career after he after his contract ends. I don't think he's going to get another contract after no. uh, his Yankee contract ends. But you know, you got to be willing to put in the time for a full season, not just show up in the in the postseason. Maybe he will. Maybe he won't. Uh, I think he wants to be close to baseball, as Pete does. And Pete's not going to get any closer to baseball than than being in the Fox booth. I th- I think it was a very lively um, a lively gathering. I think, as usual, with a lot of these shows, you can cut down on one or two people. Uh, but, you know, Burkhart's a good host, and there's a guy who's very versatile in multiple sports, moved very easily into Fox football, um, but was a great sideline guy for the Mets. And I think he's, you know, he's, 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 he's growing as, uh, you know, as sort of a you know, mediator between, you know, um, Pete and Frank and, and A-Rod. Um, and what I said about Frank, I, I, I just, I, I think Frank's too nice a guy to be in that kind of situation. He never says anything negative. At, he never says, yeah. And he's, he seems to want to suck up to Pete. And there's the hit, there's the hit king. He's, he keeps saying <laughs> over and over again. He's very impressed. He's with the hit king. And he is a great, he was a great hitter. He gave one of the best, most emotional Hall of Fame speeches I've ever seen. I, I cover it almost every year. It was a speech basically made up of like 118 people he had to thank cut down at the request of the Hall of Fame from over 200. And it was just so sweet. And he was crying. And But, you know, that is, you know, that to me shows a side of him that says, eh, I'm not going to be critical. I, you know, right. I want to praise people, but you can praise people and not be critical, but you got to say something. But he doesn't say anything. He didn't say anything in the TBS booth. He doesn't say anything in the Fox booth. Um, and, uh, you know, you wish he did uh, because he certainly has the background to do it, but it doesn't translate on television. It just doesn't. Um, much as Ripken doesn't translate very well. No, no, he's. Oh man, I didn't even bring. I didn't even think about him. He's. Yeah, he's. Yeah. He's tough to tough to listen to on a daily basis. Well, he's, he's kind of a mum, kind of a mumbler. Yeah. Um, if you and he's a know it all. Yeah. I'm, if you, if you listen real hard, he 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 does say some 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 okay things. Right. But you know, I'd rather listen to Pedro Martinez any day because. He's a he's a wild card. Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't know exactly what he was going to say. Pedro gave a great Hall of Fame speech, a great speech. And then 100%. when he introduced then when he brought Ron Marichal up to the up to the podium, that mm-hmm. was just wonderful. Um, he is he is just a a uh, uh, he's the kind of guy you you pay attention and just as he was with the pitcher, you paid attention to him. You pay attention to what he has to say, uh, and it's you know he's he's fun. And you can ask him anything. And, you know, in Cooperstown, I asked some, some people who came, some family members, I said, you know, some of what we appreciate most is that he has, I think it's, it's a rarity that you can be, have a great sense of humor in two languages. Um, <laughs> yes. That you, that you can understand the idiom both ways. And, you know, he's a very, very funny guy. And, um, you know, I, I, I listened to him. And um, I thought... At times, Dusty Baker was worth listening to, but now he's he's managing again. But Ripken, you know, just uh, when he's working with Darling, 
you only want to listen to Darling. You know, when 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 when's Cal going to stop talking? Darling and uh, Ripken did not seem like they were huge fans of each other in some of those series. I was, I was a little worried in certain points, but uh, well, yeah. I mean, when you when you see guys who aren't on the same level, and it comes across that way. Other, it comes across whether it's true or whether you feel they they don't like each other or not. Um, you know, you you almost you can imagine. You know, Ron kind of saying, "What?" You know, off the air, "What the fuck were you saying?" <laughs> or the producer saying, "Can you talk up a little bit, Cal? Can can you know? Can you get off the monotone?" Uh, it's it's one thing to respect the guy for what he did. It's another thing to hire him. You know, and now he's worked for you know two networks. Um, you know, to do this. I mean, I I I, I don't understand it. I, I really don't. Speaking uh, of networks, excuse, excuse me, only one network. He's he's always been with TBS. Speak, speaking of network, speaking of a rod. The Yes Network was dropped from Comcast in November. Mm -hmm. uh, it's January, and it's, we're doing this January 5th. There's still no deal. We don't even hear anything about it. Will an agreement happen by opening day for Yankee fans? I think that's the only way it gets settled that, you know, the much larger number of Yankee fans and viewers get upset because the number of Nets viewers has not really changed the yeah, no one cares negotiating so, stance. In real. Well, they're, well, even if all of them, you know, were upset, it's it's a much smaller number than yeah. Yankee viewers, even though Yankee viewership has gone down over the years. Um, but no, I you know I think Comcast will. I think negotiations will heat up as spring training um, advances, and uh, you know much as opening day was the critical point to get Yes on the air on Cablevision when it first started. Um, you know I think this. You know, Comcast. I think Comcast fully understands that this can keep going on during the NBA season, but it can't go on during the during the Yankee season. No. All right. So, Richard, you've been covering sports media for a long time, and I know you've probably been asked something along these lines in the past many times. What changes do you foresee happening in the future? You know, put put on your thinking cap here. You're the soothsayer. For example, you know, will blogs continue to rise in importance? Podcasts take over sports radio, and you know, will we see more players' tribune like safety zone for athletes? What I know, there's a I throw a lot at you there, but what what do you? Well, think? I, you know, I you know, I think all of those things. I think maybe there'll be a few more players' tribunes, but I, I think the safety net for players is is is, is one thing. Um, you know. I think we are pretty saturated with influential blogs. Uh, I think, you know, sports is going to be, you know, in the forefront of technology as it usually is, whether it's more streaming and uh, more podcasting. Uh, but, you know, I don't think anybody comes out well in predicting what will happen because there's going to be a new, another new technology in five or six years that will transform what we see transforming things but i you know i i see certainly i i see because it doesn't take an you know it doesn't take a genius to figure out that more and more people are watching games out of home and that you know the absolute ratings and viewership of on the the home tv becomes a little less important still important you know you you look at the number of people streaming the bowl games uh, the semifinals of the college football playoff they don't seem like they're that much, but it's growing. Every year there's more and more people watching them. And, um, you know, I think that trend will advance, certainly in whatever new uh, technology replaces what we see now, whether it allows you to watch more games more quickly. I, I, I don't know. I'm not a technologist, but I, I, I just know that what we're seeing now we're going to see more of. Right. Uh, I want to thank Richard Sandemir for being on the Red Ticket Blues podcast today. But, Richard, before you go – I have three questions to play us out. Are you ready? Sure. All right. You rated Hoosiers as your number two sports movie of all time. Was the kiss between Gene Hackman and Barbara Hershey the most uncomfortable kiss in the history of cinema? <laughs> uh, no. They, I, I mean, I, I, it, it was uncomfortable, but I'm sure there have been more uncomfortable kisses. I can't think of any. Well, have you seen Harold and Maude? No, I haven't. Yeah, well, I think it's more uncomfortable. Okay, well, then I, I, I will definitely – I'll take you up on that. Okay. Uh, number two, I lied here. One more hair question. Most okay. despised hair regrowth commercial of all time. Do you have one? Is there one that stands Most out from the rest? Despised. Um, I don't know if it's despised, but it's it's one that always makes me laugh. It's any commercial, and we saw it in Goodfellas, of a guy selling uh, hair pieces or hair weaves and going into the pool and you know, <laughs> you know, dodging into the pool. 
Uh, I mean, believe me, uh, I've seen those things float right off ahead. <laughs> it stayed uh, on Maury's head, but uh, it stayed on Maury's head. But you know, he did get whacked. That's true. His his demise was it was it was unpleasant. We all know that. Yes, it was. And the last question: favorite TV show of all time? Seinfeld. That's a good answer. I, that'd be my number two. Number one, Simpsons for me, but Seinfeld, I, 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 I can't take anything away from you there. Interesting. No, no, neither of us mentioned Sopranos or Mad Men. Both good shows. I'm sorry. Yeah. They're not my top yeah. two. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Once again, Richard Sandomir, he is the sports and TV columnist for the New York Times. You can follow him on Twitter at Rich Sandomir. Mr. Sandomir, thank you very much for being on the Red Ticket Blues podcast. Thank you. So there you have it, Mr. Richard Sandomir. I hope everyone enjoyed it because I actually enjoyed doing that a lot. Uh, not that I don't enjoy all the other podcasts, but just just saying. Rich, Rich is a very uh, interesting guy. So I think everyone uh, was able to see that listening. Well, you, you heard it. Anyways, you can always listen to the show on iTunes, TuneIn, Radio, Stitcher, YouTube, and follow me at BrianBuck13 and at Red Ticket Blues. Hey, even like the show on Facebook, and remember to leave a review. You just finished, so after you delete the podcast or stop listening, you're going to leave a review, right? Right. Uh, and all being said, I'm out of here. <laughs>